nothing I can hold on to. What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekoWatt video and in this video I'm going to be showing you how to put together an awesome $1,200 gaming PC build for not only the rest of 2021 but 2022 as well. I'll be running you through each and every one of the component choices, explaining why they're a good fit for this build, putting it together from start right through to finish before booting it up and testing out the performance in some of the biggest titles out there. Some of my favourite games, some of your guys' favourite favorite games as well. Let's dive into the build after a quick ad from today's video sponsor. Corsair's M65 RGB Ultra Wireless builds upon the legendary M65 design with the latest Corsair Slipstream Wireless tech and much more. With a 26,000 DPI Corsair Marksman sensor that can be adjusted in DPI steps as small as one, this mouse means business. Adjustable weight allows you to find your perfect center of gravity, while Omron optical switches deliver hyper-fast and precise responses. Everything you love about the M65 in 2021, now wireless. Check it out at the links in the description below. As always, I'm going to kick things off by installing as many components into the motherboard today as possible. The motherboard of choice is Gigabyte's B550 Pro Aorus board. This has got plenty of great features, including support for the latest Gen 4 SSDs, 4 RAM DIMM slots, and a built-in rear I.O. shield with super fast USB-C. Into the board, I'll be installing our processor, AMD's awesome Ryzen 5 5600X, 16 gigabytes of Corsair's Vengeance RGB RS memory, which is new and optimized for Ryzen and a perfect budget choice for pretty much any AMD system, alongside XPG Spectrix S20G. It's an RGB M.2 drive that provides a budget alternative to the S40G, which we reviewed over on the website, which you can check out in the card section here. With the board out of the box, you want to find the golden triangle on your AMD Ryzen processor. This is in the bottom left-hand corner in our case. We're going to match this up with the triangle on the top left-hand corner of the CPU socket, pulling up the retention arm nice and gently, dropping the chip into place and securing the arm back down. It's a really simple, easy process and your CPU is now installed. In this build, I've aimed to get the maximum value for money, the most bang for your buck possible. And what that means for us is using this, the AMD stock cooler. Now in a recent video, we explored how spending a bit more cash on a cooler can help increase your performance. But the conclusion was still that you should go for the best CPU you can fit in the budget. This 5600X and stock cooler combo is gonna perform a lot better than a 3600X with a really expensive AIO. This installs really easily into the motherboard using the four pre-installed holes on your backplate. If your cooler's brand new, it will have thermal paste, but ours doesn't because it's been used before. So we're gonna drop a dab of our own on, lining up the screws and actually screwing the cooler into place. Nice and easy. Corsair's Vengeance RGB RS is next. I really like the design they've done on this actually. You've got these cool Corsair triangles that seem to be spanning the range with this nice diffused addressable RGB strip up top. You can control this in Corsair IQ as well, one of the biggest selling points of a lot of the Corsair stuff nowadays. To install this, find the notch on your golden contact strip, that's the uh, gold strip at the bottom here, and line this up with the corresponding notches on the second and fourth dim slots. Pull back your clips to actually install the RAM into place, line everything up, slide it down, apply a bit of pressure, and your RAM DIMM is going to install nice and easily. This is a really, really, really solid kit of memory from Corsair and a welcome budget addition, even though DDR5 itself is just around the corner. Finally then, the last thing to install is the SSD. Now this is going to provide our storage. This isn't a flashy, super fast Gen 4 drive like the Seagate Firecuda 530 or XPG's own Blade S70. It does though have some nice RGB, provide speeds in the region of about three gigabytes a second, so still, six times faster than your standard SATA SSD, all in a package that's pretty affordable. Installing this one's pretty simple as well. You won't be able to use your standard screwdriver. Instead, you will need one of these, a teeny tiny screwdriver. Now this is a little bit overkill. It's a full set that Deepcool very kindly sent over. So shout out to Deepcool for that one. And we're going to use this to uninstall the following screw. Yes, that's right, uninstall. 
We need to remove this so that we can go ahead and slide our XPG drive into place a little something like so. Before using the screw, we literally just took out to fasten it back down. If you don't do this now, it's gonna be really difficult trying to squeeze around, get the screw out, untighten it, just take it out fully, then screw it back down and your M.2 drive is all in. With that, the motherboard assembly, as we call it, is pretty much done and it's quite heavy. We're going to move this next up into the case choice today, which is this, XPG's StarCat. Now I've used this case in a couple of builds, including one that I was forced to do lockdown at home isolating, but thankfully that is now behind me and I can get back in the studio building a proper system like this one. The Stark is a great case, an ATX form factor and a very reasonable price point that fits in sort of an underserved area of the market. This $70 give or take price point, latest pricing and availability can be found as always in the description below, really provides a good set of features with a nice IO, a bit of RGB, some decent airflow, despite the lack of a mesh panel up front and a tempered glass side panel. It ticks every box with some fantastic build quality within budget today. It's available in either a white or black if you wanna be more stealthy, but I quite like white cases and the RGB at the front with a nice bit of airflow clearance is gonna look really, really good. You can pop the front panel off as well nice and easily. It's just on magnets for easy cleaning. You've got a big dust filter and the build quality feels pretty exceptional. Look at that panel. There's hardly no flex in that at all, which is pretty extraordinary. As always, you want to remove all of the side panels, which we can do with a little bit of editing magic in three, two, one, side paniolo removal us. <laughs> Boom, aren't I a clever bean? Right, um, so once you've done this, uh, you want to get ahead and locate each of the standoffs in your case itself. These are the little black ones that stand out really well in a build like this one, uh, which is of course a white case. So here you can see we've got two standoffs at the top, we need to add a third here. We've got two standoffs across the middle with a third here in the right place already, two across the bottom and we need to add one here while removing this one. So basically move this one down to the bottom, add another standoff at the top and they will then match up very nicely with the holes through the motherboard. That's what we're trying to achieve, standoffs that line up with each of the holes through the board itself. This is quite an important step as if you get this wrong, you could find your motherboard shorting out on standoffs or on the white metal of the case itself. Once you've relocated the standoffs, you can line up the IO shield, slide this through the rear of the case and fasten the motherboard down through each of the standoff holes we just sorted out. It really is nice and simple, just take your time and the built-in rear IO shield is really gonna make things that little bit easier. That allows us to move nicely onto the GPU choice for this system, which we haven't actually touched on yet. AMD have recently released the RX 6600, but it got me thinking. I think many of us have actually overlooked the 6600 XT, providing performance in the region of something like a 3060 Ti, but at theoretically a better price point, and with here in the UK at least, more stock and availability actually available. AMD have made huge strides in the last 12 months to catch up with Nvidia, and while the supply is still not there, unfortunately, we discussed this in a recent video, which you can find in the card section now, the performance has most definitely made it. Alongside features like ray tracing, you also get AMD's own version of DLSS, which while I don't think is quite as good, is still a hell of a lot better than what we had before. And all in all, a really great package that provides fantastic straight rasterization performance. In Fortnite, for example, this beats out like a 3070 from our experience, as the frame rate just keeps on rising and rising and rising. With PCIe Gen 4 support and eight gigabytes of video memory, it definitely beats out Nvidia when it comes to overall spec, especially on the VRAM front. This Gigabyte card is a really nice design as well, with three fans up front, a fairly slim form factor that actually fits perfectly into a dual slot design, as well as a nice backplate and overall fit and finish. It is a little bit on the cheap and plasticky side, but it does provide the performance we're after, which is the key important thing to bear in mind. Installing the GPU into the case today is nice and simple. In one of those, here's what I sorted earlier moments, I've gone ahead and removed the back two white PCIe lane that we need to take off. That's number two and number three. And I'm also going to go ahead and push back the retention clip on the PCIe slot itself. It's then a simple case of lining the GPU up, sliding it in and waiting for the satisfying click sound. You'll want to fasten it down with a screw as well. And we will of course give this power shortly. It just requires eight pins. Don't get this confused with your CPU power connector, which is four plus four. This one is six plus two. And that will make more sense in a moment's time. In order to wire this up, we need to install the last component today, the power supply. This is Cooler Masters MWE Gold V650. This is an awesome choice when it comes to a build like this one that needs around about 400 watts of power under load, plus about a 20% 
20% margin for future upgrades, efficiency, and all that good stuff. It's also fully modular, meaning you only plug in the cables you need. For us today, we need to plug in a motherboard power connector. One end, of course, goes into the power supply, with the other going into the motherboard. A CPU power connector, one end, of course, into the power supply, the other into the top left-hand corner of your motherboard. A 6 plus 2 pin GPU power harness, one end, you guessed it, into the power supply. One of the other 6 plus 2 ends into the graphics card. And finally, a SATA power connector, one end of these into the power supply, and the other into the included RGB fan hub that comes with our XPG case. This will sort out all of our RGB lighting at the front. Screw the power supply in with the fan facing down to pull in fresh air from underneath the case and your system is basically ready to go. If you'd like to learn more about how to plug in those fiddly front panel connectors, we've got a guide for that over on the channel, which you can find in the card section now. For now though, it's time to see just how good this system looks when it's all cable managed looking beautiful and powered up in an epic glam montage before we actually take a look at the performance of this plucky little 6600 XT. I'll see you in a few, but first roll that montage. Something I can hold on to. Now that we've seen just how good our 6600 XT system looks, let's take a dive and look at how well it performs. I'm happy to report that overall at 1080p we were really impressed. We ran most of our games today at 1080p high settings with a few exceptions like competitive settings in Fortnite and even dabbled in a little bit of AMD's ray tracing. On your screen now is a summary, a snapshot of all the different numbers we achieved. You guys know how we run it here on the GeekerWatt channel and we are going to take a closer look title by title. The first of those focus titles is GTA 5. Here we got 117 frames per second on average, a strong result and tested in the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode. 111 and 101 for the 90 and 99th percentile results gave us consistently solid numbers all around. Moving on to Watch Dogs Legion, here we got 96 frames per second on average at 1080p high settings. This is a game that has a benchmark mode like GTA, which means you can copy our settings and run the test for yourself at home. We were really impressed actually with Watch Dogs and really got some good results. 90 and 99th percentile results were strong as well, showing you can run the game at some very consistent frame rates. And the consistency, as far as FPS goes, is absolutely key. What about Call of Duty's Cold War though, specifically the multiplayer zombies mode? Well, here at 1080p high settings, we got 135 frames per second on average. So the answer to that question is pretty damn good. 114 and 103 for the 90 and 99th percentile results rounded out a solid set of numbers in Cold War. Apex Legends is next up here at 1080p high settings we got just shy of 140 frames per second and before anyone comments this was with the apex legends frame rate cap disabled in origin which would have allowed us to get past the 140 mark the 6600 xt just didn't quite have the muscle to do so even still these frame rates are mightily impressive and the fps never really dropped below 100 frames per second with a 99th percentile result in the region of 102 valorant is the next title today and the game you want to play if frame rate is your thing because we got 450 15 frames per second on average at 1080p high. Really, really great results. Valorant look fantastic. You'd expect nothing less. Valorant will basically run on anything, but just how many hundreds of frames per second you get does depend on the power of the GPU. Cyberpunk then is our next title today. One of the most poorly optimized and difficult to run games on the market, full stop. Even so, I'm glad to report that we got 97 frames per second on average. No ray tracing or DLSS, of course. Uh, here, this is an AMD card after all, and they haven't quite bought over support for cyberpunk ray tracing just yet. To be honest with you though, that's probably for the better as we still managed to achieve nearly 100 frames per second. Frame rates were pretty consistent. 99th percentile result was a touch low at 72, but even still not much to moan about in cyberpunk. Fortnite is the next game today and this is one of the titles where we broke our own rules. We tested at competitive low settings rather than maxing things out. And I'm quite glad we did in all honesty because we managed to get 317 frames per second on average. AMD cards are the king 
of straight rasterization, especially in games like Fortnite. Even APUs, which are much lower powered, perform disproportionately well in Fortnite. Something about the game engine or optimizations AMD are putting into place gave us some really, really solid numbers. That allows us to move on to the final game today, COD Warzone. Here at 1080p high settings, we got 126 frames per second on average. No doubt if you tuned down to 1080p low, you'd get much closer to the 200 FPS mark. But for us, this worked well. Warzone, a little bit out of flavor at the moment, people are tending to prefer Apex as far as first person shooter battle royale titles go, but it's great to see that it still performs well. On that note though, that pretty much wraps it up for today's video and the benchmark section. If you enjoyed it, make sure to give it a big old like rating, get subscribed if you'd like to see more from us. Thanks for tuning in though, and as always, we'll see you soon.